named him Benjamin. That's what the name Benjamin means. It means the last one, the remnant, the leftover. So there were 12. I remember I told you very clearly that Joseph is a type of Jesus. Wherever you see Joseph in the Bible, and a story is told, you can look for a similarity with the life of Jesus. Amen? So we're going to try to see if we can pinpoint some of the similarities and see how we can apply these similarities to our lives. And so there was a love bond that developed between Joseph and Jacob, especially when who else was not in the picture now? Rachel. Rachel was no longer in the picture. And so that love was spelled in a beautiful garment that was given to Joseph. What kind of garment was it? A garment of many colors. Right? When we look over the throne of our God in, in, in Revelation chapter 4, we see a rainbow over his what? Over his throne. And Ellen White tells us that is the very character of Jesus that is personified. Our God is a diverse God. Amen? Amen? And he brings his children, he brings his love in all kinds of varieties. It may be the variety in blessings. Some have less blessings than others. Some have colors that may be um, uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, accentuated than others. But you are all beautiful in God's eyes. Because that's the God that we serve. You may even speak languages that may be foreign to others, but ultimately, God understands. And so that robe of many colors that, uh, that Joseph bore represented the very character of God. He reaches out to anyone and to everyone. He is totally open, which will accentuate the life of Joseph. The story tells us Joseph was sent out in an errand of goodness toward his 10 fellow brothers, which was misinterpreted. And ultimately, what happened? Joseph was taken, and he was sold into slavery. <clears throat> Where? Into Egypt. But the story was very meticulous in telling us that the robe that Joseph wore his royal robe, his peculiar robe, was taken away from him. It was torn apart. And it was sent back to his father. How sad. My brothers and sisters, Jesus left the splendors of heaven. We don't know what went on, but as he came to his brothers here on earth, he was misinterpreted. He was engaged. And ultimately, he was sent in prison. When we read in 1 Peter, I believe it's the second chapter, it tells us that Jesus went there in prison. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, and he preached to those who were in prison. Now, many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, they interpret that verse to understand that Jesus went into hell and there he preached to those who were in the, in the thickness of hell. What, what would be the purpose if they can't come out? Why would God want to be preaching to them? Why would God want to minister to them when they're already in hell? There's got to be a little bit more to it. No. Jesus went into hell as a standard of righteousness. Amen. He went there as a testimony unto them. A benchmark was set by that God will judge according to his law and to his character. That's what it means that he went and he preached to those who were in prison. Those who were in prison, their argument was you can't live according to God's standard. Jesus says, yes, you can. I am the standard and you can live by me. And so as we read this story, we find that Joseph had gone into prison. I want to let you know when Joseph went into that prison, he went empty handed. He had nothing. Not even that fancy robe. Oil 
the wealth of oil, the other one has intellectual property. My brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you, it is not so much what is in your hand, young people, but much more what is in your mind right that on. counts. Right on. Right on. I look a little bit further and I realize uh, that Israel GDP is about twice of Saudi Arabia. Hmm. One has oil, the other one has intellectual property. Hmm. Saudi Arabia is a lot wealthier than Israel. Somebody said that Moses wandered all throughout the desert. And when he finally found this mountain, he picked up two pieces of rock, which had of the police force. I need you to think again. Hmm. Look into the economic world. They're trying to do far more to hold you back. But if you have intellectual property, if you have Jesus on your side, yes. you will make it. Yes. How do I know? Joseph made it. Mm -hmm. He went into Egypt empty-handed. But he had made up his mind that he would stay on the side of God. Yes. Some of us may be walking around thinking black life matters. Yes, black life matters. Some may be saying, well, wait a minute, white life matters. Yes, white life matters. But when we look at that rainbow, Jesus says, all life in Jesus matters. matters. And that's where the gospel lies. Don't get sidetracked and thinking, you know, I'm all that. Keep your eyes Focus on Jesus. I have never seen souls won to the kingdom through the privilege of standing up and said, Black life matters. Hmm. Intellectual property is where it's at. Connected to our Jesus is where a future lies. Yes. Joseph shows us the way. So he went to, he went into the, the halls of Potiphar. And immediately, he was what? He was upgraded. He was given control of what? Hmm. The entire house of Potiphar. Yep. Now that's, it. that's incredible, isn't it? Yes. He's a type of who? He's a type of Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus went into Egypt, when he came into a world, he had total control of the world. And to Potiphar because you're his wife right you guys are one so if you need me to do any kind of service I should be available to you as well because I'm your servant right pretty good reasoning sounded pretty sound especially in the time in which Joseph was living but Joseph said how could I have commit this sin against who Against my God. Yes. Young people, it is not what you do in public that counts. Right. It is what you do in private. Yes. That is where the benchmark of your spiritual life is determined. What you watch, what you think in private, there is the benchmark of your spiritual life. The things that you say hmm. when no one knows who you are, no one knows who you are. That is where the benchmark of your spiritual life lies. Right. See, many of us, we have gone into the home of Potiphar and we have committed adultery. 
and don't even know it or are rationalizing it all day long. Jesus withstood Satan who's represented by part of us wife and as a result what happened he had to pay with his life mm. Jesus died Joseph went into prison but you know when I read through the story Joseph does not argue he does not say to Potiphar wait a minute this is an injustice here I have not done anything wrong he takes it because he realizes right off the bat that his justice is in who? Is in Jesus. It's in Jesus. Amen? My young people, I want to let you know, when you lift up the, that sign that says, no justice, no peace, that justice is Jesus. That, that's the benchmark of his kingdom. So uh, what you are saying in essence is, no Jesus, no peace. And you need to realize this Sabbath morning that the Jesus lies in you. And so this justice, it, be, it begins with you. God has commissioned you to bring peace to this world. To bring justice. To bring equity. Because you are a member of his kingdom. Amen. You're not going to find it. Amen. And Joseph went into prison as Jesus died at Calvary. You know, as Joseph was in prison, the story says that two dreams were interpreted by Joseph at that at a very opportune time. Two prisoners who were there had dreams and were troubled by them. The first is in Genesis chapter 40, verse 9. I'd like to ask you to turn there with me. Verse 9, they are extremely important. The dreams. The first one is found in verse 9. It says, there then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph. And said to him, behold in my dream a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. It was as though it dubbed its blossoms uh, uh, shot forth. And its cluster brought forth what? Ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh was in my hand, then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of your dream. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup once again in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butt butler and so this butler had this dream and he came forward and he said well listen this is the dream that I had and uh, you know and uh, uh, Joseph said well I can tell you all about your dream uh, your job as a butler was pretty much to stand before who help me out church oh you have masked on to stand before the Pharaoh right all right so his job primarily was to taste the meals and the drinks that were available to the Pharaoh before the Pharaoh gets an opportunity to taste them. If he dies, it simply means that someone was trying to poison who? The Pharaoh. Right? And if he makes it, the Pharaoh can what? Eat the food. Right? So that's not a bad job at all. You're going to eat pretty well. Unless somebody had a bad idea somewhere. Then you're in trouble. I was thinking about it and I'm saying, hmm, don't think I wouldn't mind that job. I just got to get somebody else to eat the food before me. Right? And I'll be that in between, right? Not, not a bad idea. You know, I, I, I'm, my mind was just running. So that was basically his job. And somehow they thought politics had stopped there, had, had stepped in. So he lost his job. And they thought that he was using his position to hurt the Pharaoh, so he was in prison. But thank God, hmm. the interpretation that what? He would be restored to his position. He was all excited, right? He said, man, in three more days, I'll get my job back. I'll, I'll be able to stand before the king. See, when Jesus went into prison, when Jesus died, he accomplished two things. 
he accomplished two things. The first thing that he accomplished was that he gave you a second chance at life. Jesus says, I am the, the vine. He is that great vine, my brothers and sisters. If you remember the very first miracle that Jesus did, he turned what? Water into wine. That was vine. And the last thing that he did, he took the cup, all right? And that cup was, what, was it orange juice? No, it must have been apple juice. Was it? No, it was grape, right? And Jesus took the grape and he says what? This is mine? My blood. And there's life in the blood. So Jesus is equating himself to the what? To the grape, to the vine. And in John chapter 14, verse 1, 2, 3, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are what? The branches. So what Jesus is saying in this dream, he is saying, well, wait a minute. I want to restore you to a position through my death where once again you will... Be able to eat of the blood, uh, to drink of the blood of the Father, to eat before the very throne room of the Father through my death. Mm. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, through the death of Jesus, you have regained your position, your place in life once more. What Satan had tried to take away from you, Jesus has washed away. Amen. That's the good news. And Jesus is calling you as the branches to bear fruit, to tell others, give them of this wine. That's what it's all about. Go out and tell somebody that Jesus is extending life freely to whosoever will. The other guy heard me of the first dream in verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 16. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in, a, in my dream. And there were three what? Three white baskets on my head. And the uppermost basket were all kinds of what? Bake goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. And this guy is waiting for what? A good comeback from Joseph, right? So Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Man, this guy probably in shock and and just looked at Joseph and said, he does. Yeah. Wasn't so good. At the death of Jesus, Satan got some bad news. When Jesus woke up on Sunday morning, that was the end of him. Ultimately, his fate was sealed. Now, what is interesting here in this picture is Satan had the same privilege that you did. Mm. To stand before the very throne room of God and fear and be fed. But like a bird, he had strange ideas. Mm. And as a result, squandered his opportunity for eternal life. Mm. He thought, according to Isaiah chapter 14, that he, he can rise up and be like God. Some of you are losing your opportunities in life because of strange ideas, thinking more about yourself than about God. Looking for your opportunities in life instead of looking to raise and to glorify the God whom you serve. Young people, this is the path into the future. Be careful lest you lose the opportunities that the Lord has made available to you. We all have, at the death of Jesus, an opportunity to feed at his banqueting table. We all do. But what will you do with the opportunities that the Lord makes available to you? This is, this is very important. 
These stories are not there as lullabies. That is your future. You know, what is interesting in this story is Joseph in verse 14 of that same chapter, he kind of plugged in out of weakness a little something for himself. He says to the butler, he says, remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness to me. Make mention of me, uh, uh, me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house because I don't deserve to be here. You see, my brothers and sisters, your luck in life your chance in your life, your break in life does not depend on others. It depends on your relationship with Jesus, Amen. with your God. Yes. I am telling you right now, your luck in life, your break in life does not depend on your weight, does not depend on your skin color. It depends on your relationship with your God. Yes. If you have made Jesus number one in your life, you have already claimed victory. Yes. Somebody might look at me this morning and says, you know what, I'm never going to make it uh, to any kind of grandeur in life because I'm not that smart. Your success does not depend on your level of intelligence. Hmm. The Lord has already figured it out. If he wanted you to be an Einstein, he would have created you with that mind. What you have right now is the recipe for success within the realm of the body in which you reside. Hmm. You must understand that. You don't need to have anybody by your side in order to achieve anything. All you need is Jesus. As a result, Joseph labored in his position in that prison a little longer than maybe even God anticipated because faith needed to be built. Relationship needed to be nurtured in God and not in this butler. But ultimately, somebody else had another vision somewhere. This time it was the Pharaoh. Amen? And the Pharaoh needed somebody to provide an interpretation. And this butler all of a sudden had this lightning flash. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was in prison and this guy can't remember his name. He was able to lead me into an understanding. And before you know it, Pharaoh uh, called Joseph and he was cleaned up and he was brought before the Pharaoh. And he was able to provide an interpretation. And as a result, and one day, and one day, Day. This is serious. He went from a prisoner to the second highest dignitary in the kingdom of this Pharaoh. Now that's impressive. That's impressive. Where you are does not matter. It is who you are with that really matters, my brothers and sisters. Somebody's walking here with his head down or her head down and saying, I'll never be anything. I want to let you know, once you are connected to Jesus, he can be anything, you, you can be anything that he wants you to be. Yes. I remember this guy, you know, well into his 80s, his wife went into a nursing home, he was an elder at my church, he still had his serenity, and he came to me and he said, man, I'm not going to go into that nursing home. See, she had dementia, and he was needed, to, he was needed by her side, because he was the only one that that she still remembered. She, she needed him for therapeutic reasons. She needed him there. And they're saying, would you please come? He says, no way. I'm not a nursing home person. And he came to me and I remember having this conversation with him and I said, well, wait a minute. When you married this woman, what was the oath that you took? And he says, you're not gonna go there, are you, Pastor? And I said, no going to go there. You're already there. I'm just visiting you. I'm just visiting you. That's my job. See, I'm a counselor. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to visit you there. What was the old again? He says, to death do us part. And I said, is she dead yet? He says, no. And I said, well, listen, I think you better, you need to get there. And he says, you see, that's the problem that I have with you, Pastor. You are too simplistic. And I said, well, what do you know? What do you know? 
right? And he sold his house and he ended up at the nursing home. And he said, Pastor, I would have been better off if I went just like the Indian under a tree and just waited for my death. Because I'm going to die very soon in that nursing home. And I said, well, I promise you, my brother, I'll be there for the funeral. That was a joke, you know? But it wasn't to him. He just looked at me and just shook his head. But he went into that funeral, into that nursing home, and he was by the side of his wife, well into his 80s. And my brothers and sisters, something happened while he was in the nursing home. He started... Um, uh, um, mingling with the, with the people, with the uh, clients who were there, with the staff. And before you know it, the nurses were running around calling him dad. Doctors were calling him pops. And this young, this man started giving Bible studies. And, and, and he started really uh, developing programs in that, in that nursing home. And we, I remember visiting him at one time. And he says, Pastor, I can't explain this to you. But this is the highest function that I've ever occupied in my entire life. Wow. Amen. He ended up writing a book. I can't tell you how many baptisms we had out of that nursing home. Amen. You don't know where the Lord is going to use you. Amen. All you know is that he's guiding your life. Yes. Joseph made up his mind in the Pharaoh's court that he was going to do the very best that God wanted. Now, I'm going to emphasize in that dream just a little bit. It was a dream that uh, uh, fatted what? Calves, right? Mm -hmm. Seven what? Years of what? Of, of wealth, right? And then seven years of what? Oh, I need you guys to help me out here. Yeah. A famine. Seven years of plenty. And seven years of what? Famine. famine. My brothers and sisters, I need you to know this Sabbath morning, please don't fall asleep. Hear me out. We have just finished a seven years of plenty. Now we're going into a seven years of famine, spiritually. We are moving into a period where things are going to get tougher and harder. If you're asking me what time are we living in, I know it's kind of hard for you to digest as a young person. But spiritually, things are going to get harder. But the good news that I have for you, Joseph, has been sent ahead to prepare the way for you and for me. Your food is assured. Your bread will be provided for because the Lord has made plans to take care of you. Amen. That's the goodness of this story. The Lord has sent help ahead of you. And so Joseph, had started a preparation. And that preparation ultimately led his ten brothers who were hungry, who needed food, who needed, who, who, who needed water, who needed nourishment to come to where Joseph was. And where was he? He was where? Egypt. Now his ten brothers... Now that number 10 is very special in the Bible. It is a number of completeness. It is a number that seems to represent God's law. It seems to represent God's church. So here God's church comes into where? Into? That's right, into Egypt. Because there was a purpose. There was a reason for them to go there. Because God wanted to use them to save Egypt altogether. Amen? And their meals were already provided. There was a message to be preached. And the Lord, the Lord needed the nation of Israel to preach that message. My brothers and sisters, I think the Lord called the Israelites into Egypt not to be Egyptians, 
<clears throat> but rather to turn the Egyptians into to the true God of the Israelites. Would you agree with me? I think the problem was that the Israelites got a little confused and they turned into what? Egyptians. And as a result, they found themselves into prison. Instead of bringing the Egyptian out of the prison that they were in. I want to ask you. Have you missed your purpose in life? See, some of us, we are influenced. Instead of influencing others. We who have the truth. Who are supposed to be a light unto others. We are intimidated. And we become like others. We dress like them. We talk like them. We think like them. We act like them. Like Egyptians. Listen, if you're walking like an Egyptian, I want to let you know you don't belong there. Hmm. If you're talking like an Egyptian, I want to challenge you. Change that language before it's too late. Because you are shackling yourselves. Young people, please hear me out. You're finding yourselves be dressing up and behaving like the world in which you are in. You need to wake up because you are shackling your very future as the children of Israel did. Can't tell. There was a time when we were growing up. You can tell an Adventist. So that's an Adventist right there. Not, not, not anymore. And they come into church with that same messed up. I don't know. I don't know. But remember, you are not an Egyptian. You are not an Egyptian. You are the, ch the child of the living God. God sent you in Egypt for a purpose and a definite reason. And so, the story brings us to the children of Israel, the ten sons of Jacob, coming right before the very brother whom they have rejected and not even recognizing him. Hmm. Didn't recognize the voice, didn't recognize that peculiar sight. They didn't recognize the smile. They didn't recognize anything about Joseph because the years had torn them apart. The thought was the furthest that Joseph was still alive. See, some of us are in church and we don't even recognize the God that we praise and the God that we worship. The God that we lift our hands in thanksgiving to. We don't even realize that he is truly of our family. That he is our brother. That he loves us. That he cares about us. We don't know him. Yet he loves us. And he provides for us. He longs for a relationship with us. He longs for you to realize that you are dignitary. That you are special. Oh, how the relationship would have been different between the brothers and Joseph had they recognized that he was of their family. But they didn't know. Oh, how your faith would change today if you realize that your father is sitting on the throne of the universe. Mm, yeah. And he loves you. He wants the very best for you. Well, I want to let you know that Jesus has gone ahead of you. He has paved. He has prepared the way for you for success this Sabbath morning. Amen. You have nothing to fear lest you forget how he has led you in the past. story tells us that 
when the ten brothers were, sent, were there the first time, that Joseph sent them back. What triggered a thought in my mind was, wasn't there 11 of them? Wasn't there 11 of them? Right? Yet, 10 had gone into Egypt. What happened to that other little guy? What was his name again? What does Benjamin mean again? The last one? Right? You know, Somewhere I have read that this lady by the name of Ellen White says, I am the lesser light and God has called me to point you to the greater light. Mm. See, there are some of us, when we go into Egypt, we want to take a little, ben, a little brother Benjamin spirit of prophecy or a little sister Ellen White with us. And the Lord is telling us this Sabbath morning, when you go into Egypt, you need to take the word of God with you. If somebody doesn't know about Jesus, you need to introduce them to Jesus, not to Ellen White, not to Benjamin. Hmm. Benjamin might come a little later, but now they want to know about your Jesus who saves. You are not going to keep people in the church by beating them over the head with EGW. <laughs> yes. She was a prophetess of God. She has her place. And her place will come a little later. But right now, when people need Jesus, you need to give them nothing less but the pure wine and the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah where you need to start. You're taking the writing of the spirit of prophecy and you're putting them ahead of Jesus. All you're going to be offering folk will be legalism at best. Stay with me here. So Joseph sent them back and Joseph said, I want to see more. I want to see more. Come back with who? Come back with Benjamin. Come back to prove to me that truly you have been what? You have been changed. Then I want to know more. Then I want to dig a little deeper. See, Benjamin comes later in the picture. They came back. They came back. And they came back with who? That's right. They came back with Benjamin and Benjamin was brought what? How? Reluctantly. We don't really want daddy to part with him. But to, to make our point, we decided to bring Benjamin with us. We decided to go with, through with it. You know, Benjamin was there and something happened. We read it a little bit further. I think it is in Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 45, verse 22. If you would turn there with me. They came back with Benjamin. And when they came back with Benjamin, Joseph went ahead and he did the unexplainable, unattainable, unbelievable. He did what the brothers could not have possibly imagined in their best of dream. He said, I am Joseph, your brother. How brilliant. I am the one who was set ahead of you to pave the way for you. Then the scale fell from their eyes. Their minds lit up. Yeah. I can see the familiarity. I can remember the dreams. Now it is becoming so much clearer. 
It is beginning to make sense to me. And you fell down with an open heart and you worship Joseph. Oh, what a day this was that then. Yep. That's the day that you recognize and who you are as you behold Jesus face to face and realize the king of the universe is your brother. To realize how much he loved you, how much he cared for you, how much he has gone out of his way to provide, to keep you, and to look out for you. I'm telling you, we're nothing without Jesus. Anything can happen at any given time. I was telling the group earlier that I was working all day, and at the end of the day, boy, I tell you, I had this hunger uh, that, 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 that was really just raging through me, and I'm thinking in my mind, okay, when I get home, Jeanette is going to have a meal for me, so I don't want to eat anything along the way. So here's what I'm going to do. I stopped to pump some gas in order to get home. And I, at the end, I just ran in there and picked up uh, my favorite, some m and I'm sorry. All right? Right? And, and, and like I told Jeanette, I kind of had alcohol clean my hands. And, and, and I just felt, if I can have those m and I can pop them in. They can keep me awake. And when I get home, I can think of that great meal that I'm going to have. Right? And I started popping those chocolate m and and I'm telling you, I'm driving and I'm enjoying them and I'm talking and my energy came back. I had this rush, right? And when I, get, when I got home, guess what happened? Man, I had this terrible stomach ache. And my best friend became that bathroom and, and for the next two and a half days, I want to let you know, I was just so sick because of those m and <laughs> And I'm going, what in the world is going on here? And Jeanette, you know, oh girl, she comes, did you get that COVID thing? And I said, no, 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 it wasn't in him. I don't want to be quarantined. You know, I can't eat anything. And I'm saying, why in the world did I take that, those M&Ms? That's how fragile we are. Yep. Anything can happen yep. at any given time. We need Jesus. Were it not for Jesus, none of us would be able to withstand the next minute. That's the pure truth. Genesis 45, 22. We're going to close there. It says, He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. I want to cover a whole lot with you. But that particular verse, I think that even if I run out of time, I just got to stop there, park there, and share it with you. This whole story, this whole mess started with Joseph and what? And up? And in his special garment. He loses his special garment. And who did he lose it to? To his what? Brothers. They took it from him. And they caused him harm in the process. And at the end, he gives them all a garment. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we have mistreated our brother, our God. We have Defame him. We have filed his name. We have taken him for granted. We have taken the garment which he has given us and have buried it and have ripped it and have torn it into pieces through wild animals. But he continues to love us. Amen? And when at the end, when it's all said and done, he comes to us and he says, may I cover you with my very own garment. Amen. Why? Why did Joseph give this garment to his brothers? Because he said, when you come before the Pharaoh, I don't want him to, to see the filthy stained garment that you guys are wearing right now. I want you to look like me. Yes. Hallelujah. I want you to look like a Pharaoh dignitary. Yes. Hallelujah. That's our God. That's our God. He has a garment for you Amen. like no other. 
to make you look just like him. I tell you, that's when you we get excited. You see, no one could have given these guys that garment except Joseph. Yes. No one could have restored them to the position that they are in except Joseph. No one can restore you to your place in society except your Jesus. Amen. No school can furnish you a degree that can accentuate who you really are. No amount of money can place you where you belong, only in Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. But what's, in, what's interesting in this story, Benjamin comes up again. Benjamin shows up again. And Benjamin is given not one garment, but he is given what? Five garments. That's it. That's impressive. You, you know that number five is extremely important in the Bible. I'm thinking of a, 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 a parable that Jesus shared. The, 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 the parable of the what? Of the talents. One was given how many talents? The fullness of God's talent. He was given five talents. Right? Number five in the Bible is indicative of a measure of faith, a measure of God's grace. Amen. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 22, those who are entrusted to be the remnant of God's people have the what? Have the commandment of God and they have the? The faith of Jesus. Yes. And the faith of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I didn't get it too far. All I did was read my Bible. Right? Those who will be blessed to preach the three angels' message will have five garments. They will be favored of God. Yes. Amen? They will be Benjamin. Now it's time to bring your Benjamite knowledge. Because it is in time knowledge. It is needed at that particular time. That's why, that's why you need to be wearing the five garments. You have the fullness of God's power. Somebody hearing me this Sabbath morning. We're given 300, 300 pieces of what? 300 pieces of silver. What does that mean? I had to look a little bit deeper into that. And then I found out that Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of what? He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. The price of a regular slave. But, but, if you wanted someone of high quality to serve someone who is worth something, it would be 300 pieces of silver. Dave Daniel, when he served in Nebuchadnezzar's court, he was found to be 10 times better than what? His peers. I want to let you know when God calls you, He will accentuate and elevate you to top notch, top price. You will be worth everything that He has created you to be. Oh, you're not an ordinary individual. Jesus has turned your water into wine. He has brought you maybe at 30 pieces of silver, but you're not staying there. He makes you 10 times better than you ever can thought to be. That's who you are today. And he calls you to preach a peculiar message at that particular time. And so my, 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 my question as I wrap up this sermon is, are you willing to stand for Jesus? Maybe I should rephrase and, and, and change the title of my sermon. Maybe I should call this sermon, What's in Your Basket? Hmm. What's in your basket? What's in your basket? See, the decision this Sabbath morning, young people, is up to you. You can serve the king again. Or through your foolish 
foolish ideas, you can squander your inheritance. It is up to you. So as we wrap up this service and the praise team is coming up for their final song, I'd like to ask, is there somebody here this Sabbath morning who is hearing this sermon and is saying, Lord, I want Sabbath morning. This is serious. Wherever you are, Lord, my prayer this morning, increase my intellectual property in you. Increase my intellectual property in you. And if that is your desire, would you raise a hand wherever you are? Lord, I need you to increase my life like you've done for Joseph. Increase my intellectual property in you. Change me to be like you altogether. Father, you have seen the hands that have gone up and they are still up, Lord Jesus. They are making commitments. They are asking, Lord, increase my future. Increase me as you have increased Joseph. Lord, I realize this Sabbath morning that I am in Egypt. Help me to stand strong and to be a type of you and to benefit from the privileges that made a difference in the life of Joseph. Father, I pray this morning that you will visit the hands that have gone up these are young people. These are adults that are looking at their lives and their futures and they are making decisions, honest, sincere, deep down decisions. And I pray that you will honor these decisions. Bless them today. In your name I pray. Amen.
great is our God. All will see. When the veil is withdrawn, and we're able to see you for who you really are, we will bow before you and recognize how God is great. And he is our brother. He is our own. So then, Lord God, we pray, keep your people in peace. Keep them focused. And may your blessings never leave. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. And we're hoping to see you again next Saturday. And may God bless you. Lord, you are good.